Today's guest is Martha Hunt Handler, the president of the Wolf Conservation Center in New York. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hi, hello, hi, welcome back to the Safari Podcast. It is time for some wolves, y'all. I am really, uh, I'm, I'm stoked to be bringing you today's episode from the Wolf Conservation Center in New York. Uh, this was one of those episodes that it, for a while just seemed like it was never going to happen. Um, so, uh, I, I appreciated that the, uh, the Wolf Conservation Center actually reached out to me and were like, Hey, let's, let's do your podcast. We'd be interested. And I was like, cool, let's set it up. And between scheduling issues and, um, emergencies and all kinds of stuff, I feel like, it was just one of those things where I was like, this will eventually happen. I'm pretty confident about that. But I wasn't really sure if it would happen until it happened. And then um, the the irony was once we finally got it all worked out and, and everything was cool on my end, uh, I got invited to the Toronto Zoo for a really cool experience on the day that I was supposed to talk to Martha. Uh, and I said to myself, self? Let's go to the Toronto Zoo and do this thing. But we absolutely cannot cancel. Fortunately, I have a great relationship with the PR team at the Toronto Zoo, having done a couple episodes from there now. So I reached out and I was like, hey, do y'all have an office that I could hole up in for an hour and do this interview? Kind of like uh, you might remember my interview with Dr. Laurie Marker from CCF that I did while at Greensboro Science Center. And the Toronto Zoo quickly responded and said, lol, no. No, I'm kidding. They were, they were very cool. But um, what happened was they were actually having uh, a bunch of remodeling done to their offices and not even all of their employees had space at the time. So they really couldn't give me any, any room. And I, I respect that and I understand that. And it was, it was very sweet of them to even consider it and to respond. But uh, it, it left me uh, a little confused about what to do. But I, I just knew it would all work out. And so I went to uh, Toronto and I went to the zoo and I did the cool thing there. And then um, I, I was hanging out outside the Red Panda exhibit and I popped open my computer and I pulled out my portable microphone setup and there's a bench right there uh, kind of off to the side. And I just set up and I did my interview with Martha while sitting outside at the Toronto Zoo, looking at Paprika running around her part of the Red Panda habitat and uh, Suva sleeping in a tree in his part of the Red Panda habitat. So it was very cool and it was a very peaceful thing. Um, and I think it kind of, you know, just set the tone for the interview because this one is is uh, very spiritual as well as scientific. Uh, it's, a, it's a different conversation and one that I really appreciate and really enjoy. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to y'all hearing kind of both sides of, of Martha's story there. Uh, so that'll, that'll be a lot of fun for y'all. But before we get to that, um, oh, I actually also wanted to mention that, um, of course, like I said, we had all these issues. And for some reason... Uh, my recording didn't capture audio right at the beginning. So that's why I introduced Martha at the beginning in the teaser where normally you would hear Martha come on and say, my name is Martha Hunt Handler and I'm the president at the Wolf Conservation Center. But uh, she said it, but apparently uh, we, re we we just decided not to record it. I don't know. I don't know what my computer was doing. Uh, maybe it was too distracted by the red pandas. But then just like a minute or two into the interview, it did start recording and I wasn't even even able to see that. Like, I couldn't tell anything was wrong. It wasn't until I downloaded the audio file that uh, I found out that um, I was missing. At first, I thought there was just nothing, and I, I had a, a small 
heart attack, but um, it was fine. It was just missing that intro. So it all works out in the end. Uh, yeah. So before we get to this interview, quick reminder to make sure that you hit subscribe. Make sure that you are following along at Ross Safari on the socials at Ross Safari Pod on TikTok. And um, I want you all to really consider checking out the show notes and going to the links for the Wolf Conservation Center and finding out ways that you can help them after you hear this incredible interview. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, here is my interview with Martha Hunt Handler, the president of the Wolf Conservation Center. All right. So um, those are your dogs and that's, that's really the most important thing. So no, um, <laughs> but we're going to talk about uh, the, the wolves and the work that you're doing, but I'm always curious about the person. So I like to start off by asking what your history has been and what brought you to where you are today. So tell me about it. So I grew up in uh, the Illinois, Wisconsin border surrounded by woods. Um, it was really beautiful. And as a really young child, I always dreamed of this one black wolf. And I don't really know why, but um, he would sort of show me different things to be doing in my life, maybe different friends to hang out with or kind of like decisions that I was making that he thought I needed to open my eyes to something different. And it was just like this weird thing in my life that I didn't ever really tell anybody about. But as someone said, What's your totem animal? I would always say a wolf, even though I'd never seen a wolf in real life ever. Wow. Okay. But <laughs> I moved away from home, um, lived all over the country. I was an environmental consultant and we moved from Los Angeles to New York about 27 years ago and we were renting a house and I started hearing wolves howling, which was very weird because wolves hadn't been here in like 120 years. So I couldn't imagine what I was hearing. I started asking all the moms at the bus stop, why am I hearing wolves? And they're like, no, they're coyotes. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I know the difference of that. They're definitely wolves. <laughs> so I walked into the woods one day and behind my house and there was uh, three wolves in an enclosure and a trailer next to it. And I knocked on the trailer door and this beautiful young French girl um, greeted me and told me what she wanted to do on the property, um, which is to start this wildlife conservation center for wolves. So she asked me if I want to help her after a few more discussions. And I said, sure. Um, by that point, I had four children and it made a lot of sense not to be commuting into New York from where we are, which is uh, a little over an hour away from New York City. So that's kind of like the beginning of my finally doing what my heart was probably supposed to do all along. Um, she. You do realize, I have to interrupt for one second. You do realize that this sounds like a fictional story at this point, right? <laughs> you, you moved I, to this area. You walked into the woods. There was a beautiful young woman with wolves there. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. I don't think it's a coincidence, you know? It's a coincidence. Um <laughs> And she's like a very, very famous French concert pianist. Her name is Alain Grimaud. And she plays like 200 concert dates a year. So I don't get to see her much these days. So a lot has uh, fallen on my shoulder. But it's been just the most rewarding work. And yeah, just like so meaningful. A few years ago, probably like, it's probably been like five years ago now, I was having massive stomach problems and I was going to internists and gastro people and no one could figure out what was the matter with me. And I went to this clinic in Austria where they make you see like, you know, kind of Eastern, Western, everything. So you get differing opinions. And I did a visit with a shaman and he put me into a trance and then he woke me up and he said, do you do something with wolves? And I said, yes. He said, okay. Cause my office has, so many wolves in it right now. I've never seen anything like this. He said, oh, okay, I'm going to put you back under and I'll get to the bottom of what's going on. When he <laughs> brought me amazing. back out, <laughs> when he brought me back out, he said, okay, so I can solve all your problems. The wolves said that you're supposed to be um, in this lifetime working for them and you're getting very distracted by other environmental concerns. And so you're not as focused as you need to be. And as soon as you put your focus back on them, your stomach problems will <laughs> disappear. 
And like, it's, it was unbelievable. Like I really was so true. I just needed to get back to, I can't do everything. And I truly believe that I'm here in this lifetime to be a wolf woman. And yeah, there's so many other issues, but that's not my lane right now. Right. Wow. That's really cool. I think that's a hard thing for all conservationists. I I know I struggle with that every week. I get excited about a new species or a new, you know, conservation organization. And it's like, I really have to dig down and find, you know, that I can, I, I need to do the work that is what I need to be doing or else uh, I, I just get stretched too thin. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. think that's actually a really good message um, for a lot of the people who listen and have that same problem, which I think most of us do. <laughs> yeah. Just find a lane and stick to it. It's better to, yeah. yeah, be directed in one way or another, not all over the place. Definitely. So did you or do you, as you worked on this, have like a standard formal education like you'd expect for this? Or was it really just like learning as you went? I pretty much learned as I went. Um, in the beginning, we were pretty much all volunteers. So we were doing everything from education to um, you know, wolf cleaning out wolf habitat, um, raising money, you name it. But now we have 15 employees and, um, a very strong board. So we have, you know, a lot more jobs. So I'm mostly out there just kind of spreading the word about what it is we do and why we're so important and why you need to jump in and help us, um, and leave the other work to everyone else. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Very cool. That's that's really interesting. This is... Um... I love stories like that because I backed my way into this industry. You know, I'm a professional musician. I have, I, I, I just, I like animals and I like uh, zoos and conservation and all that good stuff. So um, I've, I've been learning as I go, just like that. And sometimes I do feel a little dissuaded because you talk to people and they're like, well, how many times have you been published? And I'm like, ah, none, but um, you know, totally. there is room for everyone. So yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. All right, so let's talk about this place. Um, tell me what uh, what it's like now. Okay, so the Wolf Conservation Center is about an hour and 15 minutes out of New York City, um, easily reachable. And it's there because our founder was moving from France and kind of drew a big circle around JFK because she knew she'd be in and out of planes all the time. And that's how she found this little area. Um, she began to focus on wolves because she was never allowed to have a pet. She grew up in Aix-en-Provence. She was very uh, strange, was it didn't really have any friends, couldn't find anything that kept her attention. And finally, somebody at like the age of seven sat her down with a professional uh, pianist. And she knew in like 10 minutes that she was a genius off the charts. She ended up being the youngest person to ever graduate from the Paris Conservatory. Um, and she, at one point, her story is even more bizarre than mine, um, <laughs> was, having, <laughs> was having her photo taken for an album cover. And the man that was doing the photographs at his place in Florida had a wolf dog hybrid. She started psychically connecting to it. And it told her that wolves were in deep trouble. And so she decided, okay, I can never have a normal life. I can't have children. I travel too much. This is what I want to do, but I can give back in some way. And I feel connected to Wolf. So that's going to be it. So she bought a house um, where our Wolf Center is now. And she started small with just a couple of wolves and expanded it as she tried to figure out what angle she was going to take 
in the in the wolf world. So she focused on the two most critically endangered wolf species in the United States, which are the Mexican gray wolves and the red wolves. And we now house anywhere from 30 to 50 of these wolves, depending on what's going on. Um, in the case of the Mexican gray wolves, they live now just in Mexico, New Mexico and Arizona. At the time um, that they were deemed critical, there was only seven left in the world. From those seven, they were brought into captivity to start this breeding and pre-release pro program that we're affiliated with. Um, and now there's about 230 in the wild. That's amazing. And yeah, it's getting there, but it, I mean, it's been a long time and that's not really the hugest growth I can see. Um, red wolves were down to, uh, 13 in the world. Same thing. They brought them into captivity. Unfortunately, North Carolina, which is where they're living in the wild, um, has not been good to wolves and they aren't really following any of the science or the endangered species act. So they are less than, I think there's less than 30 right now. Um, so it's been a very frustrating uphill battle in both of these cases, but, um, you know, we always try to have hope and our wolves are owned by the fish and wildlife department, except for our ambassador wolves. So right now we have two ambassador wolves. These are just Mexican gray wolves because they were born in captivity. They have to remain in captivity. They're not endangered. Um, and we use them as our teaching tools. We see about 30,000 visitors a year, um, about 80% of those are school children that are coming up by bus. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been really an interesting time in the wolf world. So Trump took wolves off the endangered species list. Yes. Um, I was super pissed off about that, as you yes, can imagine. And it really <laughs> has not really changed much since then. Um, but, you know, we just we just do what we can do. So our two wolves are still considered critically endangered. So even though the Fish and Wildlife Department owns all of those wolves of ours um, in the red wolf family and the gray wolf family, we still are constantly a part of lawsuits trying to get them to uh, do what the Endangered Species Act says they're supposed to do, which is releasing wolves um, and listening to science. So, yeah, that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, the trickiest part right now is that they're only allowing pup fosters to be released. So our we would hope that they, they would let us release a whole pack, which, you know, by pack, I just mean a family. So it's parents um, and kids through probably, you know, that they've had in the last two to three years, whatever that might be, because they're used to already working together. Um, the pup is such a, a hard thing to be moving around. First of all, they're really fragile. Only 50% make it to one year and that's in the wild or captivity. Wow. So when we have pups, we call the, the fish and wildlife department. We tell them um, this female and this male just had five pups. There's three fe females, two males. Um, they go and look for one in the wild and they know that a wild um, pair had pups because they're collared and they stayed in one place for long enough that that would make sense. They say, okay, we'll take one female and one male, the strongest, you know, healthiest that you have. So we go in there and weigh them, do a little health check, take out those two at about um, 10 days old. They don't have their eyes open yet. Um, we have to find a private plane. We've been very lucky to have a group uh, called Light Hawk that's been doing most of our transportation lately. If we had to do it commercially, the pup would never survive long enough to make it. So it's really critical that we um, use a private plane. Um, our last one was just so hectic because uh, they got to the wolf, the, the site in New Mexico. And unlike every other female mother in the wild, um, wolves were usually immediately disperse when they smell us coming, they'll leave the den and leave the pups there. I, I, I want to think that they're so smart that they get that if you wipe us all out, I won't be able to have pups next year, but if I'm okay, I can still have more pups. I don't know what right. your thinking really is, but I like that theory. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. So when they got to this site, 
it was a, a horrible sleeting day and the mom would not leave her den. So the fish, they called the fish and wildlife department. They're like, okay, come down. We have another group in Arizona. Now it's like hike back down the mountain, drive another three hours, hike up into this area where the new den is. Um, the weather was still the same. This mother would also not leave her pups, but there was luckily a hole in the top of the den. And so they ended up dropping the pup. I mean, not literally dropping it, but right. just lowering, lowering it down in there. And within minutes she was nursing. So, and we recently got um, information <laughs> that she is still hanging out. So we're really happy about that. But it's, if people only knew what we're going to at this point to, you know, to try to keep this species alive, it's, it's unbelievable. And we couldn't do it without, you know, we have all of our vets, thank God that it's a canine. So they know what to do. Um, and just so many volunteers and pilots. And it really, <laughs> it takes a lot. It takes even a lot more than a village to get <laughs> one pup put into the wild. Yeah, that's really amazing to me. Um, I love the fact that I fly all around the country, you know, for for gigging and stuff. And I've never been on a private plane, but I always hear these stories of of wolves or sea turtles or whatever that get their own private <laughs> flights. You know, like it, it's it really is astonishing because I know what that stuff costs. It it is yeah. not cheap, you know. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's very. Um, Gosh, I don't know. I, I want to say it's very cool, and it is, and it's incredible, like you said, the amount that goes into it. But it also is heartbreaking knowing what's going on, uh, especially, like you said, in North Carolina. I, I've been following that and talking about the issues there for years. Um, you know, I do a weekly Zoo News episode, and I remember there were like four months straight where every single week, I had either really good news or really bad news about the wolves in North Carolina because every week something was happening. You know, Akron released uh, a couple of pups and they they were accepted well, but then one of them was found dead. And then this and then legislation was coming out. And I was just like, what? Why is this such a thing? <laughs> you yeah. know, it's, and it, it doesn't make like sense to me. There's just a few who just are very wealthy, but they hate wolves and they don't want yeah. them there. So it's been a lot, you know, there's just a lot North Carolina could be doing like our last two wolves that were released there. Um, one was killed. The guy said he thought it was a coyote and um, the other one was hit by a car. And we had been pleading with them before we gave them our wolves to say, can you just put signs up saying, you know, wolves that were in captivity have just been released. They don't, they've never been in the wild. They don't know a car from anything. Please put some signs up for people to be extra careful. And could you put collars, you know, just some kind of bright collar so that people could see this is not a coyote. Cause I understand right. red wolves are not that big. They don't look that much different than a coyote. In fact, you know, because there's so few of them, They've been breeding with coyotes, and as soon as they do that, they lose their endangered species, um, you know, qualifications because you have to be a purebred to be considered a species. So, yeah. Wow, I did not know that was happening. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah, and they have viable offspring, so yeah. Wow. What, um, not, not to derail off to that too much, but, um, like what are, what are those called and how many of those do we think are out there? Do we know anything about this? That's fascinating to me. We don't know too much. They have not been studied, you okay. know, is yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I just wasn't sure if it was like, you know, well-known or whatever, but that's, yeah, I have not heard that. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Interesting. Very cool. Um, very, very, very cool. The effort that is going into this. Um, uh, well, let me pause for a second. Cause we'll get, we'll get to some other stuff about y'all, but like in general, what can people who care about this do? Because like people that love animals love wolves. Like what's not to love They're they're big dogs that are wild. It's, it's amazing. Um, but like, what can the average person do to help with like the North Carolina situation and stuff? So our, our website, nywolf.org, um, gives you lots of resources for understanding more about this, because I think like anything, education is everything. So if you can have, um, a good conversation with people, you know, and just, really try to listen to their side of it. And if you know the facts to be able to say, 
well, actually, this isn't true. Like I get all the time, well, the wolves that were reintroduced to Yellowstone were three times the size of the wolves that used to be there. You know, not true at all. They're just... <laughs> <laughs> they're just they're just gray wolves i don't know i mean yeah some are a little bigger than others and these came from canada so they probably have a lot thicker coats than maybe people had seen but in terms of actual poundage they weren't any bigger right um it was it's just one of those things out there or you know killing livestock but you have to look at why they're killing livestock um so livestock felt, and they knew what to do when there was a predator around. They would circle up. They keep their sick ones, their young ones, their old ones, their ones that were injured, diseased in the middle. And the big ones would be on the outside that were really the strongest. And when they look like that, no wolf is coming anywhere near it. Right. Um, to appease all of the ranchers, they started, you know, giving them money to pay but to pay them for the animals that they could prove were taken by wolves um and that has proved not a wonderful technique because as soon as they have an injured or a sick or an old animal a lot of them just drag it off into the woods let it get attacked and then call the fish and wildlife department to um there's amazing really, just amazing yeah there's one woman, um, Karen Vardaman, who started this group that she really started realizing that the two sides were so in opposition to each other, the conservationists and the ranchers and hunters. And she really wanted to break through that and try to understand each other's point of view. She went to all the meetings. She started living off and on with ranchers and understanding that Yes, they're going to slaughter those animals someday, but they do feel really protective of them while they're in, in their care and they want them to have the best care possible. So she's, you know, really helped them see that simple things like having a range rider, which used to be the case for a very long time where somebody on horseback would just be making sure the animals were protected, um, flagellating, putting just things that are colorful and moving in the wind is enough to scare off a wolf. They're very skittish. Oh, wow. So they don't, they don't want something. So they're just, there's a lot that can be done to stop this. Um, and a lot of ranchers have actually started following her and doing some of these things to protect their herds. And we hope more and more people do. Um, the hunters for so long, they could charge you, you know, $2,000 come out. We guarantee that you'll get an elk because the elk are in my field for these three weeks, every year, same time of year. And as soon as wolves started showing up in the landscape again, um, those animals started acting like they're supposed to and just eating a little and moving, eating a little and moving instead of just decimating whole areas or being any way predictory. So uh, yeah, that's <laughs> another uphill battle for us. Oh man. Yeah. There's, there's a lot going on here. Um, let's, let's move away from the conservation section for just a minute to talk about your ambassador wolves, because, um, I think one of the things that I always find helps people connect to a species like wolves are cool. Like you don't have to you know, sell me on that. But um, learning about individuals, I think, makes it a little more special. So tell me about your ambassador wolves, names, personalities, what you do with them, all that stuff. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey. It's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Okay, so we usually use one particular breeder and he's breeding for these kind of education programs. We get them when they're about seven or eight weeks old. We um, 
stay with them 24 seven. So we have what we call the wolf nannies um, <laughs> so that they're never, <laughs> so you're sleeping with them. They're, you know, you're, you're just with them constantly so that they're getting used to people because wolves do not like people and for very good reason. Um, so they will probably smell you from about three miles away. So it's very rare to see a wolf in the wild. Um, so we just want them when the groups come that they will not be afraid. And when we give them treats, they'll come up to the fence so people can actually see them up close. Um, we have uh, a new one who's about four months old now. Oh my and, goodness. Yeah. Um, and he's like very friendly and very funny, very goofy, um, probably only about 10 weeks old at this point. And one of my son's friends was like, I'm really scared. I don't want to go in there. And I was like, you know, it's, it's like a puppy. It's 10 weeks old. And he's like, I just don't feel comfortable. I said, you don't have to come in. And then he saw the pup playing with everybody and was like, okay, I'll come in. And when he sat down, that pup felt, you know, like sensed fear in two seconds and was like all over him, like ripping at his shirt. So oh, much no. more like <laughs> wolf-like with him than he was with any of us. So, and it is kind of shocking because yes, every dog is 98% a wolf, no matter if they're a chihuahua or a husky, but their jaw strength is incredible. Even as a very young pup, it's very different. So much more than even our strongest dog. So like when they latch on to your shirt or your camera strap, there's no releasing their jaw. You just have to wait for them to. <laughs> 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 um, but they're, it's so, it's so rewarding to have at least that kind of contact because the rest of our wolves, we really keep them off exhibit. Um, all of our wolves eat the deer that are killed on the roadway. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so when COVID hit and no one was driving, it was like, oh my gosh, we have no food for anyone. Like it was so, I feel like I have contingency plans for everything, but I didn't have one for, there won't be any cars on the road and no deer will be hit. We were like frantically calling up every butcher in the area to find out if they had venison in their freezers that maybe, you know, the, their hunters would let or release to us. Um, and then a nice fish restaurant gave us like 3000 pounds of fish, but it was a, <laughs> it wow. was a rough time. <laughs> Which reminds me, the other day I showed up at the Wolf Center and we have this deer drop, but mostly people call us and say, I just saw a deer here and here, you know, um, and the highway department just constantly delivers them to us. So this, she she must have been in her 80s and she said, um, is this the deer drop area? And I said, yes. I said, but you can just tell us where the deer is and we'll go pick it up. And she's like, oh, it's in my trunk. <laughs> She opens her trunk and here is this dead, mangled, very large deer. And I like, how did you get it in your trunk? And she's like, oh, some nice men helped me. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> can't make this stuff up. <laughs> that's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Wow. <laughs> um. That's so cool, though. That that I mean, that's such a unique way to to handle that situation, the the feeding situation. Um, yeah. That's that's fascinating. Um, yeah, and then, okay. like gro grocery stores, like Whole Foods, and um, a couple other local markets um, bring us all their expired food that they can't have on the shelves anymore. So we can give that to the ambassador wolves, but we don't want our wolves that potentially and hopefully will be going back to the wild to get used to anything but deer and fish. Right. Because we don't want them to have the scent of beef or chicken or anything else that they decide that they like. So our ambassador wolves live very well. The other day they had an <laughs> octopus that they were like stretching all over the what? place. <laughs> ah, man, I want to come meet these wolves. This sounds incredible. Yes. <laughs> So, so tell me about, so, you know, what kind of steps do y'all have to take when you're doing husbandry and um, vet care and stuff for wolves that might be reintroduced to the wild? Or is it literally so, just hands off? It's really, really hands off, except for um, once a year, we do a health check, which is happening in the next couple of wolves, weeks for all of our wolves. And 
Um, we stand on one side of the fence. Um, usually some of our VIPs that have given, you know, substantial donations and then um, our wolf staff and we move and it chase the wolf is so afraid of us that he tries to get further and further away from us. They end up going into this, we call the catch box. Um, and then we shut it and open up the top of it and put a Y pole over their neck and we take their blood. We weigh them just to make sure that there isn't anything that we should know about. But pretty much those wolves are on their own. And we've got, I think about 7 million Facebook followers who are all following because we have one of the only video streams of all of our wolves. Nice. So you can really, yeah, watch wolves in real time. It's very addicting. Um, but there's people all over the world that are doing this and they've actually saved wolves lives when it was like three in the morning and a wolf was in labor and it hadn't been in labor when most of us went to sleep. So we we're noticing, but someone started contacting and saying this wolf has been in labor now for like four hours and it looks like it's having real troubles. It doesn't look like a normal delivery. Um, and so we called Fish and Wildlife Department and they gave us the okay to go in and give her a, a shot of calcium, which immediately stopped kind of like the violent contractions, allowed her to settle down and she had the pups within like an hour. So that's, it's really nice to have all these people keeping an eye on our wolves since especially you know, in the spring, summer, and fall, there's so many leaves and trees in there, we can't really see the wolves very well. So it's nice to have a lot of eyes that might catch something that we don't. But um, if they like broke a leg or something, the Fish and Wildlife Department would probably, you know, allow us to put it down. But there's not a lot that we really do with those wolves. We pretty much let them fend for themselves. Um the trickiest parts are because the genetics were so bad and we have to follow this huge uh, genetic diagram that helps like figure out, okay, this one should mate with this one because that would prove, you know, a, a great genetic match. Um, that's when they start getting flown around to mate with each other and they don't always like each other when they get together. So there's like a, you know, they're in between, they have a fence between them and then we watch their behavior and if it doesn't look good to us, then we don't continue further by putting them in the same um, enclosure. But yeah, so those wolves, we have very little to do with. Our ambassadors are more, well, people are seeing them all day. So you're really going to see if something is wrong with them. Um, we recently had to put down one of my favorite wolves, Zephyr, um, a black wolf. And I was just in its den crying my eyes out um when they were the vet was about to give it its final shot and the vet put his hand on my shoulder and was like do you understand how privileged you are to get to be with a wolf if it takes its last breath and that's like oh you know you're so true you know sometimes you get so caught up in things you forget like yes I'm this is really a privilege to know wolves to be around them all the time is an amazing privilege yeah, no, ab absolutely. That 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 sounds beyond incredible. Um, yeah, wow. That's uh, I'm sorry for your loss, though, because it is hard, even if it is a privilege. It is hard. I just I recently uh, said goodbye to my chihuahua of almost 15 years. And um, I still not a day goes by that I don't have a moment where I'm suddenly sitting and thinking about her for an hour. And it's it's hard, you know, so so hard. But 15 oh. years, that's it's a good long life. Yeah. Yeah. We did. We did well together, but um, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing all these stories of, of the, the, the um, conservation efforts and the releases and all that stuff. And um, you mentioned, you mentioned the breeding stuff. And is that just through, is that through like an AZA SSP or do you guys do that differently? Um, is it outside yes, it's, of that? It's still through them. Yeah. Okay. I thought so, um, but I wasn't sure. That's very cool. So it used to be um, the, the it's now the Safe Act, which is saving animals from um, yeah extinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, they decide everything. We have no say in well, we, I shouldn't say we have no say. So our wolf curator is a part of those meetings for the red wolves and the Mexican gray wolves, um, and the whole decision making of who's moving where. Um, most of the wolves in both of these programs are kept in zoos. So we're, you know, 
we're unique in the fact that our animals aren't eating wolf chow. They're actually eating deer. So that's a huge advantage, I think. Um, they get to really live in packs because we have our enclosures are two to three acres. So it's a pretty big area. Um, and we do more than just house these animals. So we educate about 30,000 people a year that come to our center and much more virtually. That's been a huge thing. And maybe one good thing that came out of COVID for us was that we more people were doing those virtual programs. And so we can do those all over the world. Um, we also advocate on their behalf. So we were talking before about what you can do to help wolves. So on our website, you can see what bills that you might want to get involved in, which is just what we, we tell you basically what to say. And so even though you don't might not live in a state that wolves are presently there, doesn't mean that you don't have a voice in these things. Um, so we tell you what, what you can do to get involved in those areas, who to write to, um, who to reach out to. Um, we are doing a lot of research. So we have some lead scientists that are going and doing papers on potentially more areas that the Mexican gray wolves could live. Um, so he's finding a lot of more habitat where these wolves could potentially survive. Same with red wolves. Um, and then we are covering the species. So we're covering a lot of different areas that most people, most groups that high have the wolves aren't really touching on. That's very cool. Um, I love that it's, it's, you know, when you started off and you, you were telling me about how, how you had um, this kind of spiritual connection to wolves and then how the, the founder had uh, a spiritual connection to wolves. Um, I think that's very cool, but I also think that science is, you know, as important, if not more important to save a species. And the fact that you all managed to have that kind of relationship with the wolves spiritually and internally, um, while also doing scientific research and working with the SSP and all of those things really impresses me. Um, it seems very, uh, kind of like what you were talking about early on about, um, like uh, new age medicine and like traditional, you know, medicine, what I like, it, it just, it, it's like you guys are hitting it from all approaches. And I think that's very cool. And I would say almost every one of our employees, either we used to have a, a traveling wolf, Adka, um, who was an Arctic wolf. And I used to bring him to the schools and yeah, all oh. different things. And so a lot of our employees first met this wolf at their classroom and something happened where they felt like, this is what I want to do. Or like our, our director of education, um, her parents planned her second grade birthday party there and she decided that's it. So it's, it's like, I don't feel like I'm the only one that's had this strange connection to wolves, mm -hmm. but it's, re it's really nice. No, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think, um, I, I, I also feel that way with certain animals. There are certain animals that I just love and I can't even explain why. And, um, yeah, I, I like to tell the story that, um, you know, I was going through a lot of change in my life and I went to the Philadelphia Zoo and I walked past one red panda exhibit and the second red panda exhibit there had this old lady who was chomping on her bamboo and I don't know what the heck it was, but I immediately fell in love with her. I started researching the species. I volunteer for Red Panda Network now. My podcast, I constantly, like, there there was something in her eyes and in her heart that goes beyond any scientific logic at all. She wasn't even the first red panda I saw that day. But, you know, I don't think I'd be doing raw safari if it wasn't for her. You know, you just, that's, yeah, there there is some of that. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Maybe yeah, someday we're going to figure it out I, how we I got like connected. That. I would like that. I would like to know. I would like to understand it. I'm very analytical. but um, But I'm okay with there being some... You know, mystery out there. something beyond that. Yeah, I am. I actually, I have to tell you, I did not realize how close to New York City y'all are. Um, when I looked it up, um, I'm in the Buffalo area uh, right now, okay. but um, but I get to New York a lot. I need I need to come hang out. I I think okay. I think we need to. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see this place and to support y'all and to, to partner with you guys to talk about this. Um, I just I'd love I just to host think it you. I wonderful. live. I have plenty of guest rooms and I only live a mile from the center. So I'm happy to host you. Amazing. Amazing. It'd be fun. So I can learn what, more about 
red pandas. Yeah, we could we could talk. <laughs> um, so what kind of like does the center do anything? Um, you know, I know that you have a lot of students there, but any special events, any cool stuff like that? Um, this Saturday, we're having a howl a ween dance party. <laughs> Amazing. Which is fun. Um, I think we're going to have a gala in the spring in May. Um, what else do we do? We do a lot of our programming. We do things like photography. So we have holes in our fences. And when you come to the photography group, those holes get open so you can stick your lens through so you can get some really good shots. We have... Sleeping with Wolves, which there's tents um, that we place around. And what's really cool is because they're corpuscular, they're most active from dusk until dawn. So you get to hear, you know, 40 or 50 wolves howling all different species. It's very cool. It's amazing. And they'll howl, you know, all, all different times during the night. So it's really magical. And our next step is to build a permanent glam camping pods so that we can do it year round because now we're restricted to just the warm months and good weather. Um, so that's a really cool program. We have sketching with wolves. Um, another one is just trying to get people to understand the difference of coyote and wolves. That's a big misconception up here of what everyone kind of lumps them together and they serve very different roles in the ecosystem. Um, do you want to speak on that for a second? Just for my listeners? Yeah, so Sure. So typically coyotes, um, they live together in families. So not so unlike a wolf, but they don't hunt together. So they're kind of on their own and they're catching generally rodents, um, mice, uh, moles, maybe a frog if they're in the mood. Um, you know, nothing bigger probably than a rabbit. Um, and wolves generally hunt together and very focused. Um, they give each other all sorts of cues of which one they think is the most vulnerable of a group. And I was just listening to something the other day that was talking about they actually want the chase because it builds up adrenaline and cortisone in the animal, which they then eat and it becomes part of their makeup for a while which keeps other wolves at bay because they're they're sensing that there's, wow, there's just a lot going on in that group. They're, they're really riled up, going to stay away from them. Um, we also just try to show them the, the size difference of, of wolves and coyotes and explain that there haven't been wolves in New York in like 120 years, so it's doubtful. <laughs> Although they all claim to see, you know, they, they, they're always telling me, no, I know I saw a wolf. And I, was like, I, I think we would have figured that out if that was true. Um, That's really funny. Yeah. But coyotes are really resilient and they've been in New York City uh, making huge uh, inroads into New York City. That's yeah. really crazy to think about. Okay, very cool. So um, is there anything else? that you want to tell me about the facility, about wolves, about your life, anything like that? I think if you haven't watched it already, you should really um, watch the video on YouTube called How Wolves Change Rivers. Um, okay. It's an amazing video. It's not very long, but it basically explains what happened when they put 45 wolves back in Yellowstone um, in the 1990s. So. The ungulates, which is everything with a hoof, so the the bison, the deer, the elk, um, the buffalo, the moose, without any predators, they were just overgrazing everything. And Yellowstone really looked like a wasteland. And the rivers weren't going into the riverbeds anymore because there wasn't any trees or any growth on the banks to keep the rivers in place. Mm -hmm. The songbirds all disappeared because there weren't trees. The beavers disappeared because there weren't trees. Um, all the little, like the mice, the scavengers, because there weren't anything to scavenge on, disappeared. And when they brought wolves back, no one expected the kind of changes as quickly as they happened. So it just quickly, the rivers started going back where they were supposed to. Um, 
trees started popping up and all these animals started popping up. It just, it's really, really an amazing outcome of just that lesson of you can't, can't fool around with mother nature. It's got a way. Right. It's right. Really perf- the perfect design. And when you screw up one little element, like probably didn't think taking wolves out was going to do anything. It has massive repercussions and wolves are not only a keystone species in that way because they, their effects trickle down through the entire ecosystem. Um, but they're also at the top of the food chain. So it's rare to have a, an animal be both, especially given its size. I mean, it's not very big compared to what it goes after. It's also really dangerous for them because animals they go after are huge. Um, one wrong kick and you know, you're gone. So in the wild, wolves generally don't make it past six, six to eight years old. Um, in captivity, they about a dog's age, anywhere from like 12 to 15 years. So wow. yeah, it's tough being, tough being a wolf. <laughs> Aww, makes me sad, but I love them. <laughs> uh, very cool. Um, so again, just quick reminder to the listeners, how can people help y'all? So go to nywolf.org and just review our whole website because we have tons of information. So a good place to learn, a good place to become an advocate and get involved. And if you're anywhere near us, come visit us. Even our Sleeping with Wolves programs, we've had, we recently had um, a bachelorette group come all the way from Australia. Well, that was nice. Really, <laughs> That's amazing. I wanted to do more than anything. So that was really cool. Awesome. And then uh, it is time. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Ron Safari Poop Story. Okay, I've got a good one. It wasn't too long ago, maybe eight months ago or something. Um, I was giving a private tour to a family. And the mother happens to be the, the CEO of the largest pharmaceutical for pets. And her son was about eight years old, um, but very smart. You could tell this family talks a lot in depth things. And when I was saying, you know, it's so desperate now because the numbers are so poor and the genetics are so bad that we are, you know, we have a frozen zoo, we have frozen eggs and frozen sperm and we're doing artificial inseminations and it's still an uphill battle. And he said, so how did they get the sperm? <laughs> I was like, oh boy. <laughs> okay. I look at his mother and she kind of gives me this nod, like it's okay. So <laughs> basically we take an electric probe, we put it up their butthole. And as we turn the voltage on, sperm comes out, which we collect. <laughs> and that's how we get the sperm. <laughs> Hey, we do not kink shame on this podcast. That's <laughs> wow. Well, hey, the the things I, you know, I've always said the purpose of the poop story is to be a little funny, but also to show the lengths that people go to to take care of animals, and that is a length. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really great when someone is like, "So, what'd you do today?" Well. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's been an absolute blast. Sure. I loved meeting you and I hope to meet you in person. Yeah, me too. You know, along with the weird scheduling issues and emergencies and audio not recording at the beginning, I've actually never heard like Zoom audio. Um, oh, that was the other thing. The other audio I, app that I used to record this stuff didn't work. It was a whole thing. But I've never heard Zoom audio make the the host, me, sound so bad while the guest sounded so good. Uh, I edited it a little bit to make make me a little clearer, but honestly, I mean, I'd rather have the guest sound good. Like, so yay, you guys got to hear cool sound from Martha and occasionally me sounding like I was calling from a phone in like 1984, like a payphone at the mall. I don't know. But uh, hey, whatever. It's all good. Uh, like I said, I, I found this interview really inspirational. And if you did as well, I want you to make sure that you go 
and uh, check out the Wolf Conservation Center. Their website is nywolf.org, and they're on social media. As so I'll put links in the show notes. Um, yeah, and I just appreciate y'all being here so much. I appreciate all of you for listening, especially my patrons, and especially, especially my Red Panda level patrons: Dr. Lara Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. So thank you all so much for helping support the pod financially. And uh, don't forget, friends, the word credits backwards is Snyder. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.